Good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started. For announcements, homework seven is due tomorrow. So uh, I delayed that one day so that if you want to chat about the homework during office hours today, then, then stop on by. Uh, so take a look at the date and time due for that homework. It's listed on Canvas. It's tomorrow, I think, for forward. It's a start of class time, just 24 hours delay. Um, and lab nine, you will be uh, executing this week and doing that pre-lab this week. So take a look at that. That's posted on Canvas. And if you have any questions during class, be sure to shout them out or shoot me a chat. OK, so I wanted to start off with um, a clicker problem on comparators, because we haven't had a clicker problem on comparators. OK, so take a look at this problem here. You have a an op amp. You could assume this is like a comparator chip. Uh, let's see here. Let me select a screen to get the clicker app running. But you have a, an op amp, or just you can assume it's a it's a specialized comparator chip that we talked about over the last couple lectures. Uh, you have VCC connected to 12 volts, VEE connected to negative eight volts, okay? And the output is here. You have a pull-up resistor of 1K and then a couple of resistors over here. So I wanted to use this not only as a, a clicker problem, but, but also as uh, an example of what I talked about in the beginning of the, the op amp lectures about uh, identifying negative feedback. I said, if there's some connection between the output of the op amp and the inverting input uh, that isn't held to a uh, constant node voltage, right, anywhere in between, then you have negative feedback. Well, here's an example where you do have some connection between the output of the op amp and the inverting input. So at first glance, you might think, well, this has this has negative feedback, but it, but it actually doesn't because this node here along that path uh, is held at 12 volts. And the way negative feedback works is the output influences in some way, changes in some way, the inverting input voltage. But it can't do that there because no matter what V out is, uh, it can't change this node's voltage, which is held at 12 volts. Okay, so that's a long explanation too. So you can assume this circuit does not have negative feedback, so it's a comparator. Um, and so figure out what is what is V out? A hint on this is comparators compare two voltages, right? The two voltages at the op amp inputs. And then you can assume uh, what we talked about, about op amp limitations. All right, so take another 15 seconds. Take a guess if you haven't answered yet. All right, let's call time on this. OK, so we have this circuit. Um, we know it's a comparator. So we have to figure out which voltage is higher, the node voltage at the non-inverting input or at the inverting input. And so since the inverting input is connected directly to 12 volts, we have 12 volts here, node voltage at the inverting input. The voltage at the non-inverting input is determined by, well, this voltage divider here, this voltage divider made up by uh, two 1K ohm resistors. Okay. Now remember that op amps have approximately zero amps going into their inputs, whether or not they have negative feedback because the inputs are high impedance. And so now we have a, 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 the same current going through both of these series resistors. Right? Zero current approximately goes into that input. So we have a voltage divider here. When you have two resistors in a voltage divider, they both have 
the same value, you could run the equation, but you get half the voltage um, across each resistor. So we have six volts here. That means this is a node voltage of six volts at the non-inverting input. Uh, and so we have, let's see, we, we call this V1, we call this V2. And so when uh, V1 is less than V2, V out equals uh, VEE. Okay, so VEE is negative eight volts. So we get D here. All right, any questions on this problem? All right. Nothing heard, nothing seen. So let's continue on. Let's get slides up here. Okay. So I want to give you a preview of this week's lab. Here is that preview. So you're going to be building an op-amp circuit. This op-amp circuit is going to be an, an amplifier. It's going to be a non-inverting amplifier uh, that operates at audio frequencies. Okay, so you're going to use a general purpose op-amp. And this is the schematic of a, of a, a non-inverting amplifier. You're going to measure the gain characteristic of the amplifier using DC and AC input signals. So applied to here to VN, you're going to apply DC and AC to VN and measure V out. Um, and I want to point out here, you'll see a couple capacitors. So these capacitors don't look like they're really doing anything because they're connected to DC power supply voltages. And what they're intended to do is maintain DC on those pins for this chip. So capacitors look like opens to DC, and that's what we want. We don't want any current flowing through this capacitor to ground. We want that current to flow into the op amp if it needs it. But we do want any AC signals to find their path to ground. So that um, essentially filters noise off of this Oh, these power supply inputs. So that's what those capacitors are there for. If you don't put the capacitors in, it might work, it might not work. So it's always good practice. Whenever you're building a circuit with integrated circuits, right next to those power supply pins, put small valued capacitors typically on the order of 0.1 microfarads or 0.01 microfarads, okay? Okay, this is the op amp that you will be using. And this op amp chip actually has four op amps in it, okay? Note the pin numbering. So this is how you identify pin one. It's usually the the uh, on the left side. Well, it's kind of hard to say. It's where the dot is. Sometimes there's a dot next to pin one, either a paint uh, mark or a depression. And sometimes there, oftentimes there's this kind of divot here, this this uh, um, kind of ridge here that indicates okay, that's the end of the chip that has pin one, and that you can then you can orient it with a diagram here. What I find is I have to bend those pins in ever so slightly to get the ends of the pins to fit into the breadboard. Okay, so I usually hold the, the pins against the bench and bend them inward a little bit. Use care when, when powering your chip. VCC is five volts, VEE is minus five volts. If you reverse polarity, you will likely destroy the chip. Um, and if your chip gets hot, you've likely destroyed your chip. You have spares just in case this happens. It's, that's not uncommon. Okay. So this is a, uh, let's see, here are the requirements here. Here's that circuit. Your requirements are a, a voltage gain of four plus or minus 5%. So that should be the measured gain that you measure in lab. So designed for four and then some variation in resistors is expected. And uh, you're going to use VCC equal to five volts, VEE equal to negative five volts, a load resistance of two K ohms, right? That means connect a load resistance between that output and ground. 
uh, a resistance value of 2k ohms. And then I have a maximum undistorted output voltage range of minus three volts to plus three volts. You should be able to get this. If you follow the guidance in the lab, um, your circuit should work. There's no real design step to achieve a range of minus three volts to plus three volts, except using the guidance about choosing the values of RA and RB. If you, if you choose RA and RB to be too small, then the output current of the op amp, the maximum output current might be exceeded and you might not be able to have an undistorted voltage range as specified here. One thing I recommend, and I still do this after 30 years of building op amp circuits, right? I take my schematic when I'm building a circuit on a breadboard, and this is the schematic I actually use to build uh, the circuit. And I highlight as I go along. So I make a connection. I connect uh, uh, you know, a capacitor between VCC and ground, and I highlight that connection. And then I connect five volts between, or I connect VCC to five volts or connect VEE to negative five volts. And I, I highlight those connections. So if, you, if, if, uh, if I'm in lab or if a TA is in lab, what they're gonna ask you first when they look at your circuit, well, is everything connected correctly? How do you know? If you show them the highlighted circuit, they'll know. If not, we'll say, well, verify your circuit and, and highlight your connections so we know all those connections are made because it's much easier to incrementally build the circuit and verify connections than it is to kind of decipher what might be wrong later when the circuit's built. Okay, and don't forget to use, the, use a common ground node as the reference node for all of your measurements and all of your, your voltage waveforms, your, your signal generator input and your DC voltage input. So you see all these ground connections here? I have three of them here. Those should all connect to one common node, okay? And then when you apply a voltage V in, the, the negative side of the function generator should be connected to that same common ground node. When you measure a voltage, the oscilloscope ground should be connected to the same common ground node. Okay. All right, so when you look at your waveforms, they, they will look probably something like this. So here's an input voltage of 0.5 volts peak, right? V in is yellow, and an output voltage of two volts peak. So output over input voltage is the voltage gain. So I get a voltage gain of four. So this is what uh, the input and output waveforms should look like when they are sinusoids. Okay. And, um, uh, and this is a non-inverting amplifier. So those sinusoids are not inverted. Um, the if you increase the input voltage and increase the output voltage correspondingly, uh, you're going to see that the voltage eventually hits the output voltage swing limit. So you can see the clipping right here at the top. So the top is clipped, the bottom doesn't look clipped yet, but you're starting to see you're hitting the voltage limits, the output voltage swing limits. And then if you increase the input voltage even more to get a bigger output voltage, now you can see both top and bottom of the output sinusoid are clipped. So, so you can read right off this plot what the output voltage swing limits are for this op amp in this circuit with this power supply and this load voltage, and you're going to record those, okay? Okay, so someone asks in the chat, so do we just choose a resistor that we want and do the math to see what goes with it? So uh, there's some guidance in the pre-lab, so choose a resistor in, in the range of of, of what I of what I mentioned in the uh, in the prelab, because if you make the resistor too small, your op amp will try to output too much current. If you make the resistor too large, you might not get um, the the negative feedback that you need to drive the input differential voltage to zero. So stay within the range that I mentioned. That's pretty common. Um, and then you so you're going to wind up choosing a resistor and doing the math. And that second resistor that you calculate should be in that range. If it's not choose another resistor um, as your first choice. And, um, and then, you know, if you're between standard values, you might use series or parallel combinations. If you're far away from a standard value um, to, to get the resistance you need, or if you're close to a standard value, you might just try it in lab and see you're within, if you're within the 5% gain requirement. Okay, so there's a quick overview of that lab. If you want to um, chat about this. Oh, let me show you one more thing. 
your output waveform might have a glitch. When I zoomed into my input waveform and output waveform, I saw this glitch here. And what that is, is that's, that's caused by the, the output stage of the op amp has two resistors, um, one that goes to VCC, one that goes to VEE. It's a push-pull configuration. And, the, and you get this glitch when the output waveform transitions from using one transistor to the other transistor. If you apply a 1K ohm resistor between V out and VCC, that glitch will go away. Okay, so you can do that to get rid of that glitch. Okay. So, uh, so that's the that's the big preview. And if you have any questions, you want to talk about that prelab, stop by at office hours, and we can chat. All right. So I want to get back to um, the digital topics. We've started the material on digital numbering and digital logic, digital systems in general. And so uh, comparators are a really good transition topic to go from analog to digital because comparators compare two analog voltages and give you essentially a digital output, a binary output, either a high voltage or a low voltage, telling you which voltage is higher, which input is higher. Okay. so. We talked about, uh, during the last lecture you watched, the discussion on binary numbering. Okay, so binary number systems. We'll talk about what, like how computers use that and why that's important and how binary numbering relates to, um, how it connects to transistors and logic gates. But I wanna finish up talking about number systems by talking about hexadecimal. So hexadecimal, sometimes, sometimes just called hex, is a base 16 number system. So we normally count in base 10. Um, binary is base 2. Hexadecimal is base 16. And it's, it's good for representing um, binary values in, in computer systems and software without having to use so many digits, so many ones and zeros. So I think you'll see that's that's one benefit of this number system. So I like to introduce hexadecimal by just starting to count. Let's let's make a table decimal and hex. Okay, so I'm just going to start counting up in decimal. So start at 0 Right, start counting up in decimal. Right, dot, dot, dot. We get to nine, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And you know, look at what we do. We've we have ten symbols that we use in that digit. So we've exhausted all ten symbols, zero through nine. And what we do um, in sort of a process described manner is we return this digit back to zero and we increment the next digit next to it. Right? And we keep counting up. So 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, we'll go up a little bit here, 16, 17. Okay. And let me, let me create like a a table here. I'm just drawing these lines. These lines don't correspond to anything in particular, any level in particular, just trying to keep my numbers straight so you can see them. So in hex, we do the same thing, except for we don't have 10 symbols, right? Zero through nine. We have 16. So here's what we do. A zero decimal is a zero hex. A one decimal is a one hex. A two decimal is two in hex. Nine in decimal is nine in hex. Now, in decimal, we ran out of 
symbols to put in that digit. But in hexadecimal, we have six more. So instead of returning this digit back to zero and incrementing the digit to the left, we use A. Okay, This is a nine, not an A. So we use A. So 10 in decimal is A in hex. 11 in decimal is B in hex. 12 in decimal is C. 13 is D. 14 is E. 15 is F. So 0 through F are 16 values. OK, so we've exhausted all of the symbols we can put in that digit. And then we do the same thing that we do in decimal when we run out of digits. You return that rightmost digit to 0, increment the one to the left. So a decimal 16 is hex 10. A decimal 17 is hex 11, dot, dot, dot. Okay. So you can see how the hex values increment compared to decimal. OK. Now, um, there, there's a fast way, a quick way to convert between binary and hexadecimal. And this is really what makes it so useful. If I have some binary value, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, just making this up. And I know that's a base 2 value. OK, subscript 2 means that's a binary value. Uh, what I can do is I can divide this binary value up into 4-bit words, 4-bit chunks. And because 4 bits of binary represents 16 values, right? 4 bits of binary, 0 through 15, uh, that represents 16 values. And one hex digit represents 16 values. I can take four of these digits, four of these binary digits, and convert them into one hex digit. OK, and so the way that works is like this. So what you do is you start at the radix. If I don't have a radix point drawn, you can put it all the way to the right here. So there's the radix point. And I work from that radix point. I'm going to go to the left here in four bit chunks. OK, so I'm going to convert these four bits to a hex digit. And I'm also going to convert these four bits to a hex digit. So these four bits would be converted to, let's see, that's this is the ones place. This is the twos place. I have ones in these positions. This is the fours place. Eight has a zero. So I'm converting this 0, 1, 1, 1 to um, first to decimal. Maybe this, this would be a, a 7 in base 10. And that's also a 7 in base 16, because I want to convert these 4-bit chunks into a hex digit. OK, and then I move over to the next four bit chunk, this four bit word here, and I convert that four bit chunk into a hex digit as if it's independent of any position in this binary number. In other words, I'm just looking at this four bit word alone and I'm converting it alone into a hex digit by going through decimal first. So let's see this one. That's in the ones position. Just looking at this four, these four bits all alone, this one is in the one position. There's the two position, but I have a zero there. This is a four position. Two to the power of three, two to the power of four. It's an eight. So this is 13 base 10, which is a D base 16. And then I just put these two digits together. So I get D7, base 16. 
So one one zero one zero one 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 in binary is equal to D seven in hex. And you might say, wait a minute, when when I when I converted this left group of four bits, I, I you know this this is the eight position in this whole binary word. This should be the sixteen position. Why is this a one and not a sixteen? Well, in binary, every time you move over one digit to the left, you're multiplying by two. Kind of like in base ten, if you move one digit to the left, you're multiplying by ten. <clears throat> so here, if I shift four bits over to the left, I'm multiplying by sixteen. In hexadecimal, if I move one digit to the left, I'm multiplying by 16. So, so that's why uh, I can take these four bits, convert them to a digit as if they're standing alone, because uh, D is really in a digit position that is multiplied times 16 compared to this seven. Kind of like this group of four bits is multiplied by 16 compared to these four. Okay, so it just, just works out that way. It's nice. And this is an easy way to convert um, binary to hexadecimal. So when you're writing computer code, if you know a, a series of bits that you want to represent, you can use two digits instead of eight digits. You will see in computer code, uh, 0x, for example, d7. So in computer code, like C code, oftentimes the compiler will interpret 0x as a statement saying, the following number is hexadecimal, it's base 16. So if you see 0x d7, that means d7 is base 16. Okay, so that's how you would write this in computer code. All right. Let's do a, a, a little more complex example where we have a fractional number. Uh, let's say we have this number. Uh, one one zero one zero one one zero zero point one 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 something like that okay and this is base two and let's convert this binary number to hexadecimal. So I follow the same process. I start at the radix point, which is explicitly given here because I have a fractional value. And I divide this number into four bit chunks, four bit words. Okay. I get to the end here, I only have one bit, but I can add leading zeros and not change the value. Just like in decimal, you could say, you know, you can add leading zeros to a decimal number or trailing zeros and it doesn't change the value. And then I work to the right side of the radix as well. And I have three digits here. I could add a trailing zero. Okay, let me get rid of that too. I'm making it confusing there, but it's still a base two number. Okay, so something like that. And then I convert each one of these four bit groups into a hex digit. So let's see. So right here, this is uh, these four bits. This would be uh, eight plus four, right? That's equal to 12 base 10. 12 base 10 is a C as in Charlie. Base 16. And then I move over. Here's this next group. 1010. One, zero, one, zero. This is 8 plus, let's see, 1, 2, plus 2, which is 10 base 10. Right? 10 base 10 is A, base 16. And then I have a 1 here, base 10 which is a one base 16. I go to the right of the radix point. And so now I interpret this as, as, you know, as if I'm just looking at this value one, 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 zero, pretend that's a standalone uh, binary value there. 
So this is going to be 8 plus 4 uh, plus 2. And so what's that? 14 base 10. That's a 10. And that's an E base 16. OK. All right, so now I put these all together, and I get 1A C point E base 16. So that's the way you express this binary number in hexadecimal. OK. And so that's that's a way to do the conversion. That's why it's convenient. Instead of writing out all these bits, you could say 1, 1 AC point E. And then you get really kind of fast at converting A to 1010 and C to 1100 after you've seen these numbers a lot and really there you know there aren't that many so you could do a quick conversion um an another way to express this if you wanted to check your result it, it, remember i wrote during the last lecture uh right 732 point something and i said it was like seven times 10 squared plus three times 10 to the power of one plus two times 10 to the power of zero. You could do the same thing here. This is one times the base to the power of its position, zero, one, two, plus A times the base to the power of its position, plus C times the base, base is 16, right? Or zero plus E times base to the power of negative one. So, you know, it replace A with 10, replace C with 12, replace E with 14, and then work these out in, in decimal. And, and, and you'll get uh, this number expressed in decimal. You can do the same thing here. Convert this binary number to decimal, you'll get the same value. All right. So this is how um, computers represent numbers in binary. And this is how software engineers represent numbers, often in, in hex, because it's easier. Um, and we're going to talk later about, well, how, how do you, how do computers, why, why do we use binary in computers? And I'm going to show you that after we talk about logic gates and logic integrated circuits, and then we'll get into microcontrollers. But this is a, a fundamental basis that we have to talk about before getting into that. OK. All right, so next I want to talk about um, how do we get logic circuits or electronic digital circuits to make decisions for us based on maybe sensor inputs or, or switch inputs. So let's talk about that. All right. So we're going we're going to have circuits make decisions for us using combinatorial logic. And so so Combinatorial logic makes decisions based on present inputs, like inputs right now, not inputs in the past, not inputs in the future. OK, using those present inputs, we're going to have the circuit make a decision. And the decision is going to be a yes or no answer, a true or false answer. We're going to use gates. And we'll talk about those gates, but gates are the, the fundamental unit of combinatorial logic circuits. And so let's let's suppose 
you're, you're trying to build a circuit. Let's give an example of what it means to, to make a decision. So let's suppose you, you have this circuit. I'll just draw it as a box. And, and it's a block diagram. And you're trying to decide, should this circuit send out a control signal to turn the starter of a car? Okay, so if this output is one or high, then starter will turn. And if this output is low, the starter won't turn, right? The, the starter motor, the electric motor that turns your engine to get it started in your car. So that's the output, should the starter turn. And the, the input, well, it could be various binary inputs or logic inputs. Right, true or false. And one, one input might be, is the key turned or is the button pressed on the starter? You know, in your car, the user interface to your car. Uh, one input might be the brake. Is the brake pedal pressed, pressed? Maybe you don't want the starter to turn unless the driver has the, uh, a foot on the brake. And you know, you might say, is the car in park? There might be a sensor in a switch position that indicates the car is in park or neutral if it's a, you know, if it's a stick. You might have some kind of feature that says, is the airbag deployed? Because if the airbag is deployed, maybe you don't want to turn the engine and something bad happens, so don't start the car. So you can think of all of these inputs that are true or false or yes or no inputs. And then you can put logic gates in this circuit that decide should the starter turn or not. This is a, this is a perfect combinatorial logic problem. Okay, and so we're going to talk about the gates that you use, you wire together, you connect together inside the circuit to make this happen. So we're gonna talk about the gates first. And then we're gonna talk about, well, how do you put those gates together to create some kind of logical function? And then we're going to talk about, well, I have an idea of I, what I want to happen here. We're going to express that in a table form. And then from that table, I'm going to show you how to synthesize a circuit, how to create a circuit from, from what you have in your head, of what you want that circuit to do. Okay, so that's the order of things here. Let's start out with the gates. Let's talk about the AND gate. So we're going to have several gates here, and we'll define what they do. Uh, the AND gate is drawn like this in a logical circuit, a schematic. OK, so it's round on one side, square on the other. These are the inputs. And this is the output. I, I'm going to use letters, that's an A, that's a B. I'm going to use letters to define inputs and outputs. These are logical variables. Okay, so A is either one or zero, B is either one or zero, C is either one or zero, logically. Now, if you were to take a voltmeter and measure this point on the circuit, if we're using five volt logic, for example, then there's a voltage here. If A is one, then there's a five volt voltage here approximately. If A is zero, there's a zero volt voltage. Or if it's 3.3 .3 volt logic, right? A one is 3.3 .3 volts, a zero is zero volts. We're not going to worry about those voltages. We're just going to work in binary values or logic values. Um, and uh, and use th those values in the expression. You're also going to hear me talk about Boolean values. B Boolean values are one, uh, one or zero. Um, and Boolean variables, these are Boolean variables. And um, Boolean expressions are like logical math expressions of these variables. Okay, so here's what the AND gate does. Um, and I'm going to define it in two ways. We're going to define what the gates do and what the circuits do using a truth table. That's one way. 
And so a truth table does this. A truth table lists all possible combinations of inputs in a table and corresponding outputs for those inputs. So the truth table for an AND gate looks like this. Well, first, on the left, let me list all possible combinations of inputs. A good way to do this is to start out at well, zeros and then just count up in binary. So there's one, there's two, there's three. And once you hit all ones in your table, you've exhausted all possible combinations of inputs. The AND gate asks the question, are both inputs true? Or are both inputs one? And so if both inputs are one, then you get a, a one at the output. If both inputs are not one, both inputs are not true, then you get a zero at the output. All right, so if I apply zero to one, Oh, sorry, if I apply zero to A and one to B, right, this, then I get a zero at the output at C. Another way to express the AND gate is as a logical multiplication. C is equal to A times B. Right, so this is a logical multiply. And so th th this is not a, a multiplication of voltages or numbers. This is, this is a logical multiply. What does that mean? It means this truth table. Right? So, so when you see A times B, you look at the truth table, and this is what that logical multiply does. Okay, if you have two zeros, you get a zero. If you zero one, you get a zero. If one zero, you get a zero. If you have two ones, if A is one, if B is one, then you get C equals one. So this truth table defines what that multiply is. Okay, so that's the AND gate. Let's look at the OR gate. It's another logic gate. The OR gate looks like this. Inputs are here on the left as I have it drawn. We'll call those A and B. The output is here on the right, C. OK, so the OR gate answers the question, are either or both inputs true? Let's write that out in a truth table. Draw a line here to separate these. So for the truth table, I'll list out all possible combinations of inputs. And then answer the question, uh, are, are, are either, either or both inputs true? Uh, no. Either or both true? Yes. Either or both true? Yes. Either or both true? Yes. So this is the definition of what an OR gate does. An OR gate is a logical addition or a logical add. So C is equal to A plus B. It's a logical add. All right. Then there's uh, let's see. So that's the OR gate. There's a logic inverter. Or a logical inverter, either way. A logic inverter looks like this. It's a triangle, except with a bubble on the output. 
it has one input and one output. The truth table for a logic inverter looks like this. Right, so zero and one, those are all combination, all possible combinations of inputs of A. The output is the opposite, it's the inverse. If you were to write um, an inverter in this form, like a, a Boolean expression or a logical expression, C is, oh, we don't have a C, we have B. B is equal to A inverse. The bar over a variable or a group of variables means invert what's ever under it. Okay, so someone says for the logical add, one plus one doesn't equal one. Well, it does, right? So this logical add, this logical add is defined like this, right? When you see a plus in a logical expression, it's not a regular mathematical add. It's not one plus one is two. One plus one is one when you're dealing with this add operator with logical variables, with Boolean variables. Okay, so, so this plus is defined by this table. This is how it works. So. Okay, and then there's something called an exclusive or. Often called, oftentimes called an XOR, XOR. Okay, so an exclusive or looks like this. So it looks sort of like an OR gate. So we start out with an OR gate, and then you put an extra curve on the back here. A, B, C. And in drawing the truth table, A, B, C, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, one, one. The exclusive or answers the question, is either input true but not both? So either input true but not both? No. Either input true but not both? Yes. Either input true but not both? Yes. Either input true but not both? No. Okay. You, you write this in a Boolean expression like this, C is equal to A plus, with a circle around it, B. So that's the symbol for an exclusive OR. And this is often called a modulo 2 addition. Mod modulo 2 add. And we'll talk about later why that is when I get to how, how, how do you perform bitwise addition with these gates in a computer? We'll talk about that. OK, and finally, uh, so these are the basic gates that you would use. But oftentimes, you'll see gates like this, a NAND. A NAND gate means not AND, right? So a NAND gate looks like this. Looks like an AND gate with a bubble on the output. And that's equivalent to an AND gate. An AND gate followed by an inverter. OK, so that's what that bubble means. It means invert. So if you take an AND gate's truth table and you just invert the output, you get the characteristic of a NAND gate. A NOR gate is very similar. You start out with an OR gate. And put a bubble on the output. That's the NOR gate symbol. That's equal to an OR gate. It's supposed to be an OR gate, followed by an inverter. Okay, so if you take an OR gate, 
invert the outputs, you get the characteristic of an OR gate. OK, so these gates AND, OR, logical inverter, NAND, NOR, exclusive OR, we're going to use, I'm going to show you how, OK, I, I, want, I want this to happen. I want the starter to turn under certain conditions, certain binary inputs here, with the starter to turn. And you can, we can create a truth table that describes this operation, this function here. And then we're going to talk about how do you synthesize that out of these gates to create a logic circuit that makes a decision for you automatically using that circuit. But for now, I have run out of time today. So don't forget that uh, homework seven is, is due tomorrow. So check, check the due time. Make sure you understand the due time of that. You'll do lab nine this week. Uh, my office hours will be right after class if you'd like to chat about anything. So stop on by if you'd like to. Um, if you don't have any questions or don't want to chat, I'll see you next time. Have a great night.